a lesson today. So this might be a bit easier to understand for people who aren't um, jazz guitar maniacs. Um, and it should be applicable really for anybody who's learning any kind of guitar. So this is to do with fretboard mapping and how to get all of the scales, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have all of the scales under your fingers, but it means that you'll have a pattern to practice without, uh, you know, for whatever scale you want to practice, without necessarily having to refer to a fingering chart or a scale dictionary or something like that. So it's really very, very simple. So we've got to know a little bit of theory to do this. Um, the first thing we've got to know is the construction of the major scale. <laughs> And to be honest with you, I think this is such a familiar sound, most of us can do it by ear. Do, do, re, mi, ba, so, la, ti, do. Okay? So, the idea is we have an octave shape, okay? So an octave, again, same note separated by an octave. So it's, I mean, it's the same note, but not the same pitch, if that makes any sense. So these are both Gs, for instance, or these are both Cs, right? So cool because you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight notes before you return back to the tonic. So it's an octave. Uh, same root as in you know, octagon. I think it's originally Latin. So that oct, yeah, deck. Deck is Greek, isn't it? That says oct. Um, so uh, with that in mind, we can start to do some work on scales. So if we just take in a single octave, and I think this is easier to do um, than doing multiple octave uh, scales because um, multiple octave scales have different incidences of the same notes that you have to change to get from one scale to the other. So if we just do an octave, that's much easier to change, okay? The other thing about octaves is that when I was starting off doing the Barry Harris um, uh, scale outlining thing, I found that I had to relearn all of my scales anyway to be these smaller fingerings because otherwise I just couldn't be... Um, sort of agile enough to get through the changes. So Barry Harris scale outlines are when you go, you know, like a, up to the seventh or up to the seventh and back over each bar. And actually they can be very, very fast. And I had to relearn all of my scales to be able to do that. In retrospect, I think it's easier to learn all of your scales smaller and then join them together than it is to have big, straggly, great big shapes that go, you know, across two octaves or more, which I think is a conventional way we tend to learn. And then once you've learned your two octave shapes, you can then start to join them up into larger shapes, which I'll demonstrate later. So let's start with the major scale. Let's start with the C octave here. Now I suggest really doing this by ear. You know, like this. Okay. Maybe the next string is easier. Try and find the same notes on. So, you know, you might do a little bit of kind of trial and error like that, just trying to hunt around for the notes. But when you find them, try and use a consistent fingering to practice them until they become second nature. So in this case, I'm using the finger of fret rule, which is not perfect, but it has the advantage of being easy to remember, and um, it always works, basically. Now, I could play the same notes in that more of a stretchy position. I personally prefer this because it's a little bit, a little bit more under the hand and perhaps, you know, other players, you know, maybe like to play more legato or whatever, might find the uh, three notes of string shape more useful, but there's no reason why you couldn't use one or the other. The point is that we're just doing an octave. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this exercise, it's really, uh, doesn't matter what, what exact type of fingering you want to do. But the important thing is that you keep it consistent, right? That's really important. Because if you keep it consistent, you can practice it and then it becomes ingrained in your muscle memory. That's stage one. Okay, so for stage two, we need to know the theoretical construction of the scale we want um, with reference to the major scale, okay? So for instance, if I want to play a, a let's take a Lydian dominant scale. This is quite a common scale in jazz. It's basically um, the same thing as a major scale, except we have a flattened seventh and a raised fourth, okay? So we can ascertain which note is which in the scale really simply by counting up. So we know that's one, because that's a C. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. So we raise the fourth up by a half 
step. So we just do that, that's a Lydian bow, right? One, two, sharp, four, five, six, seven, one. One, two, three, sorry, sharp, four, five, six, seven, one. I will learn to count, I promise, okay? And then if we flatten the seventh, we get the Lydian dominant. That's the seventh there, take it down by a semitone, flatten it. And there you go. So we can do this for any scale. So let's take, um, obviously, all the diatonic mode. So if I wanted to do a uh, Dorian, we go back to the major scale. Now for the Dorian, we need to um, flatten the seventh and flatten the set third. So we go one, two, three. So that was what third is normally. Take it down by a, a half step or a fret. That's the melodic minor, right? So it's got a flat three, but a normal seventh. Where well, you can remember the melodic minor, or at least the jazz version of the melodic minor, which is the same going up and down, is the fact that it is basically the same as the major scale, except the third has been flattened. But that's not what we wanted. What we wanted was the Dorian mode, and to get to a Dorian mode, you also need to flat the seventh. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Take that down by semitone. We get this. And that's your Dorian mode, right? Okay. You can refinger this however you find useful. Okay. Uh, that, that's all within the same the same octave shape. It's just that the different fingerings, different like different people with different techniques and different uh, backgrounds will prefer perhaps different shapes, but all the shapes function in the same way. They're all one octave shapes, okay? Um, so for instance, we wanted to do a harmonic minor. Well, a harmonic minor scale has, compared to the major scale, a flattened third and a flattened sixth. So we go, let's do the flattened sixth first. So we go, we go past another scale on the way, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so let's set the sixth down by a semitone. It's a harmonic major because it's got one, two, three, four, five, flat, six, seven, one. Now, to turn it to a harmonic minor, we need to flatten the third. And the third is kind of an important note because it's what tends to differentiate major from minor. So, if we do that, one, two, three, flat, three, okay. There we go with the harmonic mi minor. Now, this is end up being quite a stretchy fingering, so you might prefer to refinger it this way. Or not, maybe, depending on how you play. Um, if you're a sort of Alan Holdsworth fan, you might prefer the stretchy voice, uh, the stretchy fingering, for instance. Okay. So um, let's go for what is the most altered, and each of these sharps or flats is an alteration. So the most altered of these scales should be the altered scale, right? Um, the, the clues in the name. And another name for the altered scale is a superlocrian. You often hear that. And I just like to differentiate the um, the two. Um, for me, the altered scale really refers to its harmonic function over the altered dominant chord, whereas a superlocrian refers to its construction. So, what's a locrian? Uh, before we think about what a superlocrian is, and the locrian is the seventh mode of the major scale, and compared to a major scale, it's a flattened two, a flattened three. Natural fourth, flat and five, flat six, flat seven. So every note is flat apart from the one and the five, uh, one and the four. Sorry. So this this would look like the third. Take that down by six as well. How do you find it easier? Four is normal. Five down by semi tone. Six here, flat, there's flat. Seven is flat as well. So we get this this sound. often used modes um, of the major scale and I would argue probably that the altered scale is probably used more often or the superlocrian is probably more used more often than the regular locrian. So to get superlocrian it's kind of just the next step. We flatten every note apart from the root which means we flatten that fourth as well. So we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. That's down. One, flat two, flat three, but the fourth is also down. So it enharmonically becomes the same as a like, major third. It's actually a flat fourth or a flat eleventh. And then a five goes down by a semitone as well. And a sixth goes down. And there we go. 
a superlocrian. So the altered scale differs from a superlocrian just by naming, okay? So instead of going one, flat two, flat three, flat four, flat five, flat six, flat seven, one, we go one, flat two, sharp two, we reassign the function of that note, so it's a sharp two or a sharp ninth. Major third, instead of a flat four, because let's face it, flat four, I mean, who's ever played a flat four chord? Um, flat five, flat six or flat thirteenth, depending on the spelling. It's often referred to as a flat thirteenth, just this is often referred to as a flat nine. Sorry, that's a flat nine, that's a sharp nine. Flat seven, one. Okay, that's how we do an altered scale. Hopefully I've kind of outlined how you can quickly go through and uh, basically change your major scale to be any of the requisite scales you might want to be working on, okay? Um, now, a uh, couple of things. First thing, we can take other scale shapes, and this is probably a good idea, just so you get your connections in your mind and, and, and your perception of this to be complete. We can take other scales. So for instance, if you've got a, you know, a, a fingering for a Dorian mode, Like that, say, say Dorian. Let's keep it down to one octave. So, you know, to know that you can just raise a third, one, two, three, raise it up a semitone. You've got a major third in there. So that becomes a mincellinian or dominant scale, as I call it in bebop land. And then if you raise the seventh, you get a major scale or Ionian mode, as people insist on calling it if they've been to music college. Well, the right kind of music college, or the wrong kind, depending on how you look. Look at it, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, natural seventh, one, okay. The same way you can take that to one mode, turn it into a melodic minor maybe. That's a seventh, raise that up a half step. Four. And you get the melodic minor and so on. So it's really important that you do that with all the scales you can think of. Okay, a couple of things. First of all, um, we have added note scales and we have pentatonic scales and added note scales such as the ones in Barry Harris's uh, um, teaching or the bebop scales popularized by David Baker are, um, are notes with extra uh, scales with extra notes in so for instance if I take a, a dominant scale which is the same thing as a mixolydian uh, with an added major seventh between the flat seven and the one then we could take an ordinary major scale shape let's take our C major scale shape like this <laughs> Add a flat seven there. Okay, or we can take the um, you know perhaps a more complicated version of the added note scale would be the version that has an added note not only between the one and the flat seven. Uh, this is for a dominant chord, by the way, but also between the three and the two and the the, the one and the three. Sorry, the three and the two, and the one and the two. So so that goes one. Seven, flat seven, six, five, four, three, I didn't note there. Flat three, two, flat two, one, so which is another Barry Harris added note scale. Okay, pentatonics are what happen when you take the um, take the notes away. And the most common pentatonics are the major and minor pentatonics, although there are other pentatonic modes and interesting scales you get from all over the world that have five notes in them. Um, for this example, I'm just going to take the most obvious one. So we take C major scale, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, and we take out the four and the seven. One, two, and that gives you the major pentatonic. Now for the minor pentatonic, let's. I mean, we could just treat it as a mode of C major. That's by the way. I mean, when we're constructing modes in this way, we're thinking of them as being parallel objects as opposed to being relative objects. So. Um, a lot of my thinking and scales can be quite relative. Uh, so, for instance, you know, I might talk about playing D melodic minor on a G7 chord instead of talking about G Lydian dominant, okay? That's a slightly different thing. Um, you can think about things both ways. So what I'm doing here is heavily parallel. I think it's good to practice both because it really teaches you the fretboard. The guitar is not an obvious instrument like the piano that's laid out from left to right. You really do have to sweat at this stuff to learn how to do it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a parallel... Uh, working out this so we're gonna instead of having the um, you know the uh, the major pentatonic we're gonna have a minor pentatonic so I'm gonna need to construct a minor scale let's go from scratch so I've got this major scale shape here major major scale we're gonna use natural minor that has a flat third flat six and flat seventh in
ultra mm. minor. Okay, so the rules for the minor pentatonic are slightly different. In major pentatonic, we're removing the fourth and the seventh. In the minor pentatonic, we're removing the second and the sixth. One, two. There's a sixth there. We don't play it. Okay, there you go. There's a little one octave shape for a minor pentatonic. Okay, so. Um, I whizzed through that, but this is, this is how you can practice this stuff, right? It's, it's really nice and clear and systematic. I wouldn't bother doing more than about five minutes of it in a session, but you'll, you'll rapidly build up your scale, working out chops, um, also learning the fingerings as well as you go. So um, now, how do we join together multiple octaves to create longer um, scale lines? And it's actually quite simple. So if I take like... For instance, let's take this C major. Well, we've got another octave up there. So this is an octave, and we're going to go to this C, right? So we can go. Okay, well, we have another scale. So you need to work that fingering out, okay? Okay, I mean, this counts, by the way. Oh, I don't, I've run out of frets. Okay, so um, you, you could continue up one string if you wanted. You know, that would obviously be an octave shape, but just one length of, of one along the length of one string. I'll move it down to B flat, so I've got enough frets. That's my B flat there, so we go B flat. So that's another way you can actually have, a, have an octave shape. I mean, a, a more elongated one, which might be this. So you're going to that C there, for instance. Now that suits four notes of string. So you're not limited to playing in these constrained little boxes if you don't want to be. Every, every, everything can be an octave shape that, that is an octave on the guitar, and you can stretch a scale from any two notes and find different pathways through it. And that's how you can start to learn the entire neck, okay? We can go. Yeah, like that, for instance, okay? And we go. We run out of notes, right? So now you can start to extend your scales across the whole neck and you're not limited to playing these positions yeah that's the idea anyway um okay um yeah so i hope you find that useful let me know in the comments below that's a bit of a lesson really um yeah that should keep you going for scales for a long time um thanks for watching